Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Weather Survival Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. My roommate slash bestie and I decided to go on a cross-country road trip where we spent whatever savings we had doing whatever the heck we wanted for nearly two weeks. After finally returning home the next week, we found out that there was a huge storm brewing in the Gulf. Being dumb college kids, our parents made us evacuate with them. My dad worked at a local hospital in the suburbs, and everyone was required to go through the storm, but they were allowed to bring their families. My mom, dad, and I packed up and planned to stay at the hospital. The usual hurricane plan was to hold up for a few days until the storm blew over. This was different. The storm passed. Levees broke. Chaos ensued. We were terrified, sure, but we knew my parents' house was safe, as we had a pretty good view of the surrounding neighborhood from atop the hospital parking garage. Compared to other stories of horror, we lived like kings. The hospital ran on a generator, so we never lost power, and we were never without food and medicine. Crazy stuff ensued, of course. Dogs were rescued and operated on since doctors were kind of bored at this point. Parties were had. All the while, the surrounding city was decaying. When the waters went down, people were able to return home. My parents' home in Medari was unharmed aside from small damages, but totally livable. My college house with my roommate had water up to my second floor bedroom. I was able to salvage most of my things but my friend lost everything. Turns out, a family must have held up there for a bit, as I found diapers, candles, car keys, etc. The only things looted from my home were essentials, soaps, towels, and blankets. The only jewelry stolen from all of my valuables was a metal cross, which I believe they may have needed, so that's totally cool. Turns out, my house was marked as having a dead body upstairs, probably my room, and probably why my comforter was gone. After recovering a bit and moving in with my parents in the weeks after the storm, I began to make the most ridiculous stupid money ever made as restaurants were cash only. This did create a sort of screwed up lifestyle, but I cleaned up my act. My dad was working at the Windsor Court Hotel pre-storm, and when it hit, he and a selection of the staff were on the premises. They spent the bulk of the storm moving priceless pieces of art to locations to keep them safe from any potential damage to exterior walls and the resulting exposure. He said the first night after the storm had passed, he went up to one of the higher floors and looked out. He says it like this, Man, it was crazy seeing the city like that. No lights, but an occasional beam from a flashlight or something like that, and quiet. No cars. No music. No people. Just the occasional gunshot and someone hollering. It was just big and dark and gothic, like a Batman movie. He said that it was unreal to see, but he realized the wheels had come off when he was looking out a ground floor window at a subway restaurant across the street and a man threw a trash can through the front window, and then a moment later he set the store on fire. The arsonist then screamed and ran through the street like it was the best thing ever. My dad then went on to say, It was right there. I was thinking, oh boy, what's stopping this guy from killing me? The National Guard came by not too long after. He told the staff that they were all going ASAP, 
He said they drove out in a line of cars like elephants, walking through a dark forest with trunks holding tails. And once he got out of the city, he drove up to Baton Rouge where I lived. He was shell-shocked for a few weeks thereafter. I was a new kid in the USA for the first time, and we settled in New Orleans from the jungles of Borneo about three years prior to the hurricane. As there aren't many natural disasters in Borneo, we were pretty freaked out by hurricanes so moved away every time something came close. When the hurricane hit, I was around 10 years old, old enough to know what it is and how serious everything was, yet not yet old enough to really understand. Basically, I saw the whole thing as a big adventure, where I got a week off school. I only really grasped the loss and devastation to the whole community years later, upon reflection. Anyways, about a week prior to the hurricane, my dad was thinking, oh no, not another one, because we have been there for a few years. The only difference was that the projected path for Katrina was headed straight for us, but usually it turns last minute. A three or four days prior was when people started worrying, and I remember Dad said to me that this one was going to be a bit more serious than the rest. Mom was not in the U.S. at the time, so just me and Dad. When the city ordered a mandatory evacuation, Dad was like, Yep, pack your things, let's go. I remember putting all of my favorite toys on the top shelves and leaving the old ones closer to the bottom, just in case of flooding. I put most other things on my bed and took a collection of 20 stuffed animals, which I insisted I need with me in the car. I don't know what dad was thinking, but he kept telling me this was serious, but ended up leaving really important documents, such as the passport, his master's diploma, etc. in the house. Anyways, with my treasure secured, I loaded everything into the car and prepared for the six hour drive to Houston. We had a family friend in Houston, which we could go and live with. At the time, we also knew several other families in the area from the church we went to, so we called them up and were going to leave for Houston together. Everywhere we went, everyone would have their TVs set to the news or the weather station. There would be constant updates on the wind speeds of Katrina and path projections, etc. So there was supposed to be five families, which left together, but when three of us grouped, the other two called and said they needed more time packing. At this time, we hear that the freeways are getting pretty packed, so our three families decide to leave first. Cue long and boring drive, lots of traffic and endless road. What usually takes six hours to drive took us eight. Luckily, we had enough gas, food and water and everything, and made it to Houston after a long day drive. We were one of the first among our friends to make it there. After we arrived in Houston, the family friends showed us where we would stay, and the adults congregated downstairs to watch more news weather. Us kids actually set up board games upstairs. There were around 70 or 8 of us then, and had lots of fun so time passed pretty quickly. After almost half a day, we see another family arrive. They left an hour after we did, and apparently took 10 plus hours to drive from New Orleans due to the traffic buildup. The last family arrived middle of next day. Turns out the roads were closed and they had to detour north. Their overall journey took 20 plus hours, and they left around 2 or 3 hours after we did. In total, there were between 30 to 50 people living in the same house, including children. So for the next week, we kids sort of enjoyed an extended sleepover where we would actually do lots of fun things in Houston City. We went ice skating, went to a park, and also, I remember jumping on this huge trampoline. I think this was necessary for the adults to de-stress, because otherwise they were all just downstairs watching the news. After a few days, Dad told me that the hurricane hit New Orleans, and then the atmosphere calmed a bit. I remember that we kept checking Google Maps satellite view because we wanted to know whether our house was still there or not. It looked the same for a few days, but after about a week, we saw that the huge tree in our backyard fell onto a part of the house, 
so there would be some damage, but otherwise it was still there. After one week, we heard that New Orleans was struck pretty bad and were told that we could not go back. Even just to take our stuff, we'd have to wait until the area is secure. Dad and most of the other families decide to move out and find apartments in Houston and enroll me in a school. After one month, Dad leaves for a few days with all his friends to New Orleans. By this time, Mom flies back to the U.S. to take care of me. Dad did not want me to go, because it was still pretty dangerous due to the looting, and I did not want to get an injection anyways, so I stayed home. He left for the day and came home later with lots of stuff, including his documents. He told me that our house was pretty alright. We had four inches of flooding, but there was moss and mold everywhere. I learned that while our house was good, one of the families we lived with had lost their whole house with more than nine feet of flooding. While all the other families came back with stuff, their car was empty. Other than that, another family which just moved to the U.S. was also having a bad time because they did not have time to buy insurance before the hurricane. While they had minimal flooding, because they were so inexperienced with hurricanes, they actually thought it would be like a day trip and went to stock up their fridge before. And when they went back, the house stank. Anyways, we got along for the next few months in Houston. Parents sorted out all the insurance and everything while I just focused on school. I remember being quite amazed at how friendly all the adults were to me. I got free meals, some senior citizens club knitted blankets for us, and there was just lots of support. After a few months of school, we had a break where we went back to New Orleans to stay at a friend's place for a week. They were away, and we helped them look after the house. We visited all the places we used to go, and saw basically the aftermath of the hurricane. My old school was completely flooded over, and many of the house's restaurants were destroyed and or closed. While lots of repairs had already started, you can still see parts of the city which were like ghost towns. About a week into staying at the house, we came back to the house to find a tank blocking the street. We were confused, and some police officers just told us we had to turn back and find someplace else to stay that night. We went to live within another friend's house and kept looking at the news wondering what happened. Only the next morning did we hear that the direct neighbor was a veteran who had mental issues and apparently holed himself in his house and started shooting randomly. We heard that he had run out of medication and just went crazy. When we went back the following morning, we saw blast marks around the outer walls of his house and broken windows, etc. The door to our friend's house was opened and some of the furniture had been rearranged, so we guessed that the police slash military used it in some way. Mostly it was the furniture near the windows facing the neighbor. This specific incident for me highlighted how different New Orleans was now, and also the difference between it and Houston straight after the hurricane. After one year, we left the United States because Dad was posted elsewhere. Only late last year did we visit New Orleans again. We met many of the neighbors which we did not see for eight years and saw that the city was doing really well in terms of rebuilding. The parts which we visited were as they were before the hurricane and I got to visit my old school and the library which I used to hang out. Overall, even though I did not really understand the hurricane, it did really show me how impermanent life can be. While I believe we were very fortunate compared to most, it did force me to grow up a bit. At the same time, the experience showed me how amazing some people can be and how even very simple things such as a blanket during the ordeal could make it all seem much better. I still have that blanket with me and am using it while I type. That's my story. Hope I didn't bore y'all too much. Thanks for reading. This is something I've never really talked about before. I was living on the West Bank at the time and worked on Chupitopolis Street as a line cook. I was sent home that morning and remember thinking this is just another hurricane scare. No big deal. My mother was a nurse on the West Bank. We decided it would be best to stay at the hospital to weather out Katrina. I don't remember much from the hurricane, but the week that followed was one of the most formative experiences for myself. 
and certainly made me more appreciative of the relative normality that I enjoy day to day. Help was extremely slow coming. I was volunteering around the hospital as the staff dwindled to a skeleton crew. Nurses, medical doctors, aides all left to be with their families and check on their homes, but none of them returned. No police presence whatsoever. At night, I would go up to the roof and watch the fires burning out of control across the river. We were the only functional medical facility in New Orleans proper. Some patients requiring life support made their way to us early on. Our hospital was the last one with electricity. People were walking across the bridge from the devastated East Bank, attracted to the light of our building. I remember staff turning people away, back into the pitch black city because we couldn't take anyone else in. They looked like the real walking dead. We heard reports of savage R-wording and murders happening in the Superdome and Convention Center. It sounded like the bowels of hell to me. The manager of a Walmart gave one of the hospital admins the key to the store so that we could freely loot it. I remember really respecting him and wondered if it was Walmart policy or if he was just being a good human. I helped put a man in a body bag. A friend of mine drove in Rambo style from Baton Rouge to get me out. Jacked up truck, AR-15, tactical this and that. The whole prepper package. I stayed with him for a few days before getting a ticket to Philly. I left Louisiana to never return. But overall, I had it pretty easy compared to the other hellish stories that I hear. I've lived in Huma all of my life. My family had stayed through Andrew when I was younger. I figured Katrina was just going to be another storm. A few years later, Ivan was supposed to go up the mouth of the river, but returned at the last minute. I figured this would be no different. The Sunday before, I was in the Superdome for the preseason game against the Ravens. I remember seeing Bob Breck, local meteorologist, on the big screen with the storm on the radar in the background. Everyone booed. I remember driving home having this odd feeling. When it became evident that it wasn't going to turn, I packed up and headed a little north. Everyone else I knew had evacuated. I had heard horror stories of 16 to 20 hours to get to Houston. I decided to go to my mother's about an hour north in Donaldsonville, west to southwest of New Orleans. The storm was intense. The neighbor lost their roof. My mother lost multiple trees, one nearly falling through the center of the house that we were in. My truck, parked near her front door to protect her home from any damage, would slightly lift off the ground and move a little with the wind. The noise was like a constant freight train for hours. This was one of the only times in my life I've actually been afraid for my life. After the storm, we spent the next few days clearing out my mother's backyard. You couldn't walk through it with all the fallen trees. On the third day, I figured if I was going to be hot and nasty, no power or cold showers, I might as well be hot and nasty in my own home. On the drive home, I started to realize the gravity of what had just happened. I was far enough inland that flooding wasn't a problem, but the wind had caused mayhem. I had to drive around a hundred-year-old oaks thrown across the highway. Power lines were folded like toothpicks. We listened to the radio, and we had heard about the New Orleans being flooded, but we didn't get it. Friends who had evacuated had told us about the flooding, and we were, yeah, yeah, water, no big deal. When I finally got home, I turned on the generator, flipped on the TV, and it really sunk in. People on roofs. Their homes like islands in a sea. They were already trying to repair the levees, but the damage was clear. New Orleans looked like a total loss. I didn't think it would ever recover. 
All of the towns south of us had flooded out, with families losing everything. Uma had fared pretty well, minus the wind damage to a few brick storefronts. We dealt with no power for about a week before things started to go back to normal for us. A couple weeks after the storm, I drove through New Orleans on the way to Florida, and I will never forget the landscape. The fact that New Orleans has recovered as well as it has is a testament to the resiliency of his residents. My story happened on my 50th birthday. My wife and sons asked what I wanted to do for my birthday. My expected answer was a weekend on Long Beach Island, New Jersey. The town of Beach Haven is where my favorite hotel is. It was June 7, 2012. It was a beautiful beach day. So the four of us walked to the beach to set up our things for the day. As the day goes on the west side of the island, we could all see a dark gray weather front approaching the area. We've seen this kind of weather many times over the years. As the front approached, we could see far west to the mainland on New Jersey, which was clear and beautifully blue. So we figured the front would be around 15 minutes as it passes. As the front was over us, it started to lightly rain. My wife and I tucked in under an umbrella and my sons continued playing catch. The rain continued, and then it started to get windy, so I brought the umbrella down to the block the wind. My wife and I were dry and blocked from the wind. We were happy knowing this will be over in minutes. Well, no warning, no area thunder. A bolt of lightning blinded us like a flashbulb. Hitting the umbrella I was holding, and sizzle boom I call it, I felt the lightning travel through my left arm into my chest and then out of my feet into the sand. I yelled some choice words. My wife and I were talking and moving my arms and legs, so I looked okay. About 15 seconds went by and again, boom, another bolt hit down the beach about 100 feet away from us. Panic set in, so we all ran off the beach left everything behind except for car keys, jumped in the van and drove back to the hotel. I had a very large glass of vodka and couldn't believe what had happened. When I finished my drink, we all went back to our beach spot and our phones and my wallet were still there. The sun came back out. I was sore for a few days and now I have a new respect for thunderstorms. Happy birthday to me. In 2010, I had a day that changed my life forever. My wife and I took our boat offshore to the east side of Cape Lookout, NC, where we always had great fishing catches. That day, we went to the Atlas Tanker Wreck east of the Shoals off the Cape, and then to my favorite hard bottom offshore of Chicken Rock. Our first drop, we both caught huge groupers that had their heads out one end and tails out the other of our 151-quart cooler. The next drop resulted in two more the same size, completing our limits. It was time to go home. The day was so calm, I had rolled up the curtains on our T-top, so we could move faster. As soon as we got close enough to see the lighthouse, I saw a sight that chilled my blood. A front had moved in, and a purple-black storm cloud stretched as far north up the beach as far as we could see, and ran a solid, deadly line south, disappearing in the rain that fell from it in torrents. Orange bolts of lightning danced down its entire ugly face. Uglier still was the massive water spout sitting on the offshore sandbar, that formed the southern side of the slough, where we would need to cross the shoals to get home. By now, the wind had picked up to more than 40 knots. The seas were a wind-whipped nightmare. My wife held the bow, 
and I fought my way to the locker under the bow cap and got us life jackets that we helped each other into as the temperature crashed and we were engulfed by pelting torrents of hail. Somehow I managed to drop my front curtain providing limited shelter from the blasting hail, rain and sand being sucked from the bottom. As I attempted to jog to my right to get around it, I saw a smaller twister directly in my path, cutting off our escape. The next moments were a blur, as I prayed that my wife would survive. The swirling wall of wind-fueled ice blew the big old hull on its side, and I felt a super hot flash and was momentarily blinded. Suddenly we were through the worst of it, and I regained my control of the steering and using my GPS plotter, followed my outgoing track across Cape Point. It was still pouring buckets of icy cold rain mixed with hail nut we were through the worst of it. Standing in a freezing slurry of several inches of accumulated hail, still getting blasted by more, I managed to get our side curtains down and resumed our course down Shackleford with lightning crashing all around us. With a couple of miles to go back to Rough Point at the entrance to Beaufort Inlet, I made a hard right turn causing my wife to ask where the heck I was going. I'm getting close enough to see the beach, I replied, because if another one of those things gets us, I'm driving us on the beach and we're going to run for it. As we got to the inlet, the front cleared the coast and it turned into a bluebird clear day. It wasn't long before I had the boat on the trailer and we were in the warmth of the truck heading home. As I dried out, I started to smell singed hair Looking down, I noticed the burns on my left arm and a second burn on my left shin, a couple of inches above my ankle. Looking at my face in the rearview mirror, I gasped and pulled over, because the singed hair and red flash burns over the left side of my face told me what the hot flash I'd felt during the water spout had been. My wife is an RN, with all the cardio qualifications, so I felt confident when I asked her if I should stop at the hospital to get checked out. I decided to go on home because my heart was fine, and they'd probably keep me overnight for observation, and they don't serve beer. It's a good sea story now, but it was the last trip I took on my boat. The beginning of changes I could never foresee. I still have PTSD, or at least a deeper understanding of folks that do. I was trying to seek shelter in the shark encounter outside viewing area at a theme park because it had a large cover, but was denied. So I went to stand under the shark feeder that happened to be next to the flagpole. Lightning struck the flagpole and then me. It came in through my left hand and exited out of my right foot. I was taken to a hospital in Orlando, Florida. I was 24 years old and a mom studying to become a nurse when I was struck. I've suffered long-term issues, including chronic severe pain, swelling in my lower extremities, heart problems, severe headaches, and fatigue. I don't know what life has in store for me, but it's seven years later, and I'm still in horrendous pain, and doctors have no idea how to help me. I was on my way back from volunteering at a festival in Denmark when the weather turned wild. My friend who's frightened of thunderstorms with reason apparently experienced my ignorance. You never get struck by lightning. I got off the train in the middle of Copenhagen and considered myself quite safe considering that taller buildings were surrounding me and that it's a rare phenomenon to get in a large city. So I went to unlock my bike to start my journey home not knowing that the second I stood up against the pylon my bike was locked against, the lightning would strike into the pylon. I experienced conduction, with the lightning traveling through the pylon, my bike and then me. The seconds seemed like forever, and all I remember clearly is myself screaming very loudly, a power going through me, and being surrounded by intense white and purple colors, as if you were traveling in a spaceship faster that light. That's how crazy the colors looked. I didn't faint, 
Luckily, otherwise, my heart most likely would have stopped, or I would have experienced heart problems. The shock you experience when something so unreal happens to you is indescribable, and you're overwhelmed with sadness, ridiculousness, confusion, laughter, and luck. I called the ambulance myself when my arm started to tingle, spasm, and tense up in unreal ways, also seeing as I thought it would be safer to get checked by medical experts. A fast trip to the hospital turned into an overnight stay with long needles and company consisting of elderly folk being positive about their heart problems. They did not expect a 19-year-old girl as a roommate for the night. That was sure. I was released with the comment that nothing is wrong, but you might experience some psychological trauma. I experienced way more than that. It may have been because of the psychological trauma, but no doctors in Denmark had knowledge of what exactly the symptoms are from getting struck by lightning. No one really knows how to deal with it. This was the biggest realization for me. It was not as normal as having PTSD from a car accident or other trauma. It runs deeper because you start to question the health of yourself. At first, I thought everything was fine. Of course, my muscles and nerves were more tense than ever. But I was in school, stressed, and carried heavy books every day. A more reasonable cause than your safety system still alarming yourself. I went to physical therapists, acupuncture, psychologists, chiropractor, and spoke up about my feelings and symptoms. Yet, nothing seemed to help permanently. Thinking back, I realized I've been way more affected than I thought so. I've experienced what I realize may have been a slight depression, had a personality change from extroverted to closing myself off from others. I've struggled sleeping and felt like I was fainting, fatigue not being uncommon by now. I'd never really experienced headaches before, and now they occur more often than pleasant, not knowing if it's because of the muscles tensing up or because there's actually something wrong. The uncertainty makes you go into a spiral of anxiety where you overthink whether the tingling in your legs, arms, and fingers come from something way more critical than just muscle tension. Your heart beats fast and suddenly goes faster. You think you're suffering from a heart attack or high blood pressure. It all blends together, and you experience an unusual anxiety attack where you still function but with less concentration, more introverted, and more tired. Your body working on extra high alert exhausts you in a way only people with experience can imagine. The incident changed me, and it's debatable whether it was for the better or worse. You are forced to look into yourself and question the actions of your body, but it also limits you to do things you would have been able to do before. Getting struck by lightning is such a rare incident that no one really knows how to act around you when you experience changes. And medical experts have such little knowledge about the symptoms that they have a hard time guiding you. I'm sure other victims of electrical shocks and lightning shocks will have had similar experiences. A few months ago here in Houston, Texas, I was indirectly hit by lightning. I was standing at my back door, inside. The door was closed, but my hand was on the metal door frame when I was hit. I went to the emergency room via ambulance and didn't have burns, just bruises and chest pain and weakness on the right side of my body, which the jolt went through. I was released after being admitted for about 13 hours and was told that I might have some late side effects, but never told what that would be. I've noticed the past few weeks that I get random brain fog and memory loss. Like yesterday, I forgot the name of a song that I had just learned how to play and how to actually play it. My husband had to show me a video of myself playing it in order for me to remember. Things like this keep happening. I was supposed to follow up with a neurologist, but with no insurance and over $30,000 in medical bills, I can't even afford to pay. It's just not feasible.
I was hit by lightning while playing in my backyard with bow and arrows shooting targets. I was holding arrows in my hand with metal tips near my ear, bending over to pick up more arrows when lightning hit me. I still have some hearing loss and ringing in my ears. My story falls under the category of ironic. It was my last day of living in Florida. I was in career transition, leaving the chief meteorologist post at WJKS in Jacksonville to become the weekend meteorologist at WEWS in Cleveland. It was a typical late summer Saturday afternoon. The cumulus towers were starting to build and the thunderstorms would soon arrive. The moving vans had just departed and we were putting the final touches on cleaning the house. My job, vacuuming the living room. I heard the first clap of thunder, and then the downpour began. For those of you that have never experienced an afternoon thunderstorm in Florida, here's how they typically work. There's lightning and thunder, torrential rain, and occasional gusty winds, all which lasts about five to 10 minutes. Then the sun comes out. It's not really a cooling rain, it just makes things more humid. This particular thunderstorm would have been of no concern, but we had a screened-in back porch, and I had left one of the windows open. So the torrential downpour was now soaking the porch's indoor-slash-outdoor carpet. So I shut off the vacuum, opened the sliding glass door, walked across, reached over and grabbed firmly onto the metal window frame to shut it. It was at that point that I looked and saw all the little hairs were standing up on my wrist. I thought to myself, now would be a good time to get out of here. The next thing I know, I'm on my back in the living room. My oldest son, who was about two and a half at the time, was standing over my face. He said, Daddy, that was funny. Do it again. Normally, I'd laugh, but I couldn't talk. In fact, I was, in the immortal words of Led Zeppelin, dazed and confused. Just then, the door flew open, and my next-door neighbor ran in and asked if everyone was okay. He saw me on the floor and started to assess. He was a sheriff's officer. He started asking me a bunch of questions, and when I finally spoke, I asked, What happened? He said, You must have been struck by lightning. I saw your house get hit. That's why I came over. I sat there for a few moments and finally declared, there's no way that I just got struck by lightning. I'm a meteorologist. Yes, I really said that. Luckily, I survived. No major damage except for a burn on my back, where we surmised the lightning went up and out of me. The real irony? I was on the Duval County Board of Lightning Safety. I was lucky enough to pass along this story and act it out to a couple of thousand school classrooms over my 20-plus years on television. Every so often, I'll run into one of those students who is now all grown up. To a person, they all remember the lightning story and my lightning safety lessons. When you hear thunder, go inside. When you're inside, no baths or showers. Stay off of any cellular phones. And don't hang on to any metal window frames. My name is John. In 2013, when I was 16 years old, I was struck by lightning on Labor Day weekend at my lake house in Gainesville, Georgia. I coded for four minutes and 48 seconds. They thought that I was dead. Thank God I got struck while my buddies and I were playing football in a field. There was a doctor, pastor, and a nurse watching us play. There was storms going on that we ignored. When I was directly hit by lightning, the doctor ran out and immediately started CPR and chest compressions. After almost five minutes, they were able to revive me and get me to a hospital in time. At the hospital, they put me in a coma to protect my organs, 
and then transferred me to the doctor's hospital in Augusta, Georgia, where I was in a coma from August 31st to September 4th. They said that I would not be able to walk again, but I'm walking and jogging two months later. After one more surgery, I'm told that I will be back to 100% after the long recovery process. Then, I will be able to return to high school and my lacrosse team, but I won't be playing in thunderstorms anymore. I have an apartment in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, on top of a five-story building. It is at the bottom of the major mountain pass and five blocks from the beach, so the warm air collides with the cold air from the mountains directly above my building. All summer there are epic storms in Vallarta, and I always seem to be in the heart of the storm, so I always go inside when they begin. I was in my bedroom, with both my front door and back door open. They line up perfectly laying on my bed and trying to calm down my loving terrier body. He was shaking violently, and I had my hand on his head telling him not to worry. I will keep you safe. Seconds later, looking out my open bedroom door, I see a four or five foot stream tube of lightning flying through my apartment and splintering in all directions. It seemed like slow motion. The lightning entered into my spine, which was pressed against a wall and left two holes in my back then went into my pet's head, which fried his hearing and vision. He is deaf and blind now. All of the electronics as well as my refrigerator, phone, internet, etc. exploded or shorted out for good. Many of my Spanish clay roof tiles cracked and fell in. My neighbors on the lower floors rushed up to see what happened. I was in a state of semi-consciousness. My neighbors saw some smoke come out my back from the holes. It took about a week to clear my head, and then the huge changes in me began. I started to know so much, such as when I was being lied to. I could see who was a bad person and predict when things would happen. I would know what the truth was in most situations, even if I was not there. This changed my life dramatically. I dropped so many people out of my life. I had been incredibly social, happy with hundreds of friends, and all of a sudden I knew who and what was real. I had no more desire to be very social. Many said it was depression or bipolar disorder. The lightning did cause me to have some nerve damage resulting in a tremor in my hands, mostly my left, which is my dominant. This hand gets very bad when I am tired, and like many others, I now sleep less and have terrible insomnia, and I am far less patient. I was struck by lightning outside while working as a game warden in Millville, New Jersey. I was in the middle of a tree and my work truck that had a six foot aluminum ladder in the back. We were all hit. The tree looked like all the bark flew off where the lightning rolled around the tree. The truck's electronics were fried and I was found in the middle of the truck. I lost conscious for a few seconds, couldn't see anything, then flashes of light and then my vision came back. I couldn't feel my limbs. I couldn't move them. It seemed like they were not part of my body. A, my heart rate was erratic, but a cat test came back okay. I did a follow up with the doctor. After complaining about my head still hurting, they found a golf ball sized wound in the back of my head. I lost my career doing what I loved because I could no longer carry a gun. My whole life changed in an instant and will never be the same. I still suffer from the barometric pressure. My head gets heavy and I don't have the ability to concentrate when there is a storm coming. I don't even watch the news because it just stresses me out knowing I won't be able to get things done that I need to because of the storm. Resting my head helps, but nothing takes the annoying vibration sensation that goes on in my head. For the first two years, it was a long, slow recovery. I'm still not fully recovered. I lost my ability to talk right and walk without swaying or falling. 
I gave up at one point and just didn't get out of bed for six to eight months. It was just so hard that getting dressed was a huge chore to accomplish. I would constantly throw up or feel sick to my stomach if I moved, so I just chose not to move unless I had to. I had such severe migraines and dizziness every day all day long. Nothing helped. I felt like that feeling you get when riding in an elevator and it stops. I had that all day. My vision got worse for six months. I got a new prescription and my vision went back to normal. A doctor diagnosed me as having something wrong with my eyes and said he could help, but my insurance never approved the treatment. Still, if I move my eyes quickly, I get sick to my stomach. I can only drive on days where it's not that bad. I don't trust myself otherwise. I'm a lot slower than I once was. I walk slower, talk slower, and think slower. I used to be pretty fast paced. My family and friends say that I'm more normal speed now. It doesn't make me feel better though because when you are used to being one way your whole life, then it drastically changes in an instant. It's hard to cope. I know I could be a lot worse and I'm thankful that I came as far as I did. I try to deal with what I have and make the best of every day because you never know when your time is up. Everything happens for a reason and I'm trying to figure that out and do the best that I can with what I have. My whole life I used to sit on my porch and watch the storms with my dad. I love to see mother nature's dark stormy sky roll into my backyard. I still like storms, not as much as I did due to the complications I get from the weather changing, but they are still beautiful. I definitely have a new respect for storms and an understanding to stay safe. On Saturday, July 14, 2012, in Belfair, Washington, I was in an open field setting up the sound system for an outdoor event. There was a lightning storm in the hills around us, but I didn't think anything about it. I don't remember the lightning strike or the loud thunder that soon followed, but I was later told that a lightning bolt struck two trees behind the facility, debarking one in a spiral pattern and split the other in half. It appears it then traveled through the ground to the transformer box where the PA system I was working was hooked up. I was holding my iPod in my left hand, which was attached through a cord in the power amp. All of a sudden, I felt a horrendous shock go through the tips of my fingers and up my arm. Then my chest muscles felt like they were pulled out and snapped back like giant rubber bands, launching me out of my chair. When I came to, my left arm was burning like hot pins and needles, and my chest muscles were in spasms. My heart was beating fast and erratic. At first, I thought I was having a heart attack. When I came to, people were screaming. We got hit. I only remember bits and pieces of the event afterwards. I remember holding my arm to my chest in pain and looking down at my right shoe and wondered why there was a hole in it. There wasn't one when I put it on earlier that day. Power and communications were blown out to the facility, and they had to run off emergency generators for the event. Later on in the day of the strike, I noticed a large bruise appeared on the front and the back of my left bicep muscle. It was not there before, so it's possible that the voltage went up my arm and maybe exited a little out of my bicep muscle front and back, then traveled into my chest. A friend looked at my shoe and said the voltage had to ground somehow and it must have traveled down and exited out of my shoe causing the hole. The next day I felt like my heart was running a marathon, but I thought it was just an adrenaline rush. Two days later, I woke up and drove to work feeling really disoriented. I reported the event to my supervisor and was told to fill out an electronic accident report. I couldn't figure out how to complete the form, so I contacted the safety officer. He said he heard about the lightning strike and offered to help me complete the accident report. After that, he drove me to the hospital to get checked out. The doctor told me I was very lucky to be alive. They mentioned and the full effects might not be evident for up to 10 or more days. The strangest thing started to happen with my body. Before the strike, 
I was also dealing with severe back pain, but after the strike, I was virtually pain free except for the pins and needles in my fingertips and spasms in my chest. No pain in my back or anywhere else. I remember first feeling like I was like a squirrel on a wheel because I couldn't slow my heart rate. After it slowed down, I experienced feelings of confusion. I got lost in my own house, and at times I didn't even know where I was or what I was supposed to do. I would start things and forget to finish. I had to relearn how to the simplest chores, like grocery shopping. I would be driving and not remember what exit to take or where I was at a given time. I was a master at multitasking, but for months afterwards, I had problems doing even one thing at a time. At work, I would sit and stare trying to remember what to do. As the days progressed, the fog started to clear. As my brain became clearer, the pain returned more intense than ever. I remember waking up 16 days later and I could hardly put on my shoes. I decided to go to urgent care. The doctor looked at my arm and referred me to an occupational therapist for treatment. The pain was debilitating. All I wanted to do was lay down and sleep. My energy level has since improved, but I still deal with chronic pain and depression. This experience changed my life, and I have a whole new respect for the power of lightning. If you can hear it, seek cover, and don't go near electrical appliances or devices. I live in the deadliest state for lightning, Florida. Unfortunately, I let a friend talk me out of using my better judgment one day. We were in Naples, Florida, enjoying a day at the beach. I saw the storm coming from the glades and told him several times that we needed to leave. Being from the Northwest, he didn't believe me. Finally, the thunder was very close and we started to leave. A bolt struck in the grassy area beside us and I was struck by a secondary finger. It ran through my body and out of my toe without leaving damage. Two days later, I began feeling lethargy and a growing headache. A trip to the ER revealed a concussion. I definitely learned my lesson. Hello, my name is Jennifer. I live in Pensacola, Florida, and I was struck by lightning on June 21st, 2003. The weather was rainy. However, there was no thunder or lightning. My husband and 12-year-old son were outside on our covered patio when lightning and thunder hit at the same time directly over our brick home. My husband said that the flash was bright and the thunder sounded like a cannon going off. He hurried my son and himself into the house, only to find me at my stove with lightning running through my body and out of my front legs. I was on our phone when lightning entered through my left ear, traveled down my body, and out the front of my legs. The lightning formed a big orb around my legs and then dissipated into the floor. The phone was shot out of my hand and into the pot on the back burner of the stove. I had discoloration to both fronts of my lower leg area and bruising. However, no burns and only one blister. The phone ironically still works. However, the charge was drained out of it. My stove works. There were no burn marks found anywhere in or around the outside of the house. However, the garage door opener was fried. It hurt like heck. My joints were brittle and were going to break if I moved. However, I was able to communicate and move my body. My husband took me to the hospital, and on the way to the hospital, I started twitching slightly and feeling cold from the inside out. I went into seizures approximately 30 minutes after the strike, and they lasted about three hours. I spent a couple of days in the hospital. I was left unable to walk on my own, but could move all of my muscles. My vision was blurry for weeks. Now I'm able to focus better. However, my eyes feel strained continually. 
Headaches and tremors are frequent, and thankfully decreasing in the intensity and frequency. Everything in my body was shaking for weeks, and I was cold continually. It took six weeks to feel warmth again in my body. I am able to walk now, and am in physical therapy three days a week. I have memory loss, vision problems, hypersensitive hearing, numbness, and all over weakness. I'm so thankful to be alive and know that I am blessed to still be here. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.